So then you join the Nation of Islam. You end up not going to college. Right. But you put all your effort into the nation. At what point did you actually meet Farrakhan? Was that early on or later? I met the, the minister the first time when I was 19 years old. Uh, when I left high school, I got married at 19. And my wife was pregnant, but I wanted us to live in Chicago because that's the headquarters of our nation. And I felt like I could go there and get the supreme training that will make me uh, the most effective tool, weapon, and instrument in the hand of my minister that I possibly can be. So when I went there, I was working uh, for a security company that we had, and there was a situation where there was a, a brother beating a sister with some handlebars to a bicycle. And I stepped in the middle of it, got the handlebars, took them from him, and he hit me with a pole, left the building, went to another building to make a long story short, ran over to the other building, and when I came up, I hit him and held him down. And lo and behold, while we were holding him on the ground, the same sister that we were protecting him from came out of her apartment and tried to stab me. So I grabbed her arm, took the knife. We left, went downstairs. By the time we made it down the flights of stairs, he had told everybody we jumped him. Uh, and needless to say, those that were with me that were on the security force, they didn't stay uh, with me. They went another direction. But I was calling on Allah and moving toward them and didn't realize I was by myself. So I got jumped and put in the hospital. And during that time, I, was, I got out of the hospital and the minister held a meeting and we all came together and I was on the front row. And I had had a cut that went from the top of my head all the way down to here. And my, I had a scab that covered my whole face, closed this eye, head was swole, ribs was broke, but in three days I was 100% healed and looked normal. So the minister, when he seen that, he seen the picture, and that was my first uh, chance getting to meet him. And he uh, told me, put something in my ear about what he thought about me and what he thought about the future for me. And I've been trying to do the best I can to, to live up to that ever since. Well, you eventually moved back uh, to Indiana. Right. And... That's when you joined Mosque 74? Right. That's was, that was my birth mosque. That's where I first came into the nation in Indianapolis at Mosque 74. And I went back there uh, just to offer my service to the mosque. And I ended up becoming the minister of the mosque at 20 years of age. But I was so young that uh, the, some of the officials had already told everybody, don't y'all get used to him being your minister, he's too young. So I was the interim minister. But during the time of an interim term, for only I was there interim for six months, we uh, doubled in ranks. And we became the most outstanding study group in the central region for that year. And then the next year, the most outstanding mosque. And so the minister wrote a letter installing me as the minister at 21 years of age. Well, what's interesting about Mosque 74, well, number one, you guys purchased the land that the mosque sits on? Yes, sir. And there is a child care center, a Eat to Live cafe, and a barber and a beauty salon on that facility. That's correct. So it's really like a, a self-enclosed you know, enclosed, uh, facility. It's a, well, what it was, it used to be a strip mall. And we purchased wow. the strip mall and gutted it, left only the three walls uh, standing, and went in and reconfigured it and built our own school. We have our own school, and we have the space for the daycare, and we have the restaurant and the beauty and barber shop. We just converted that over, and our grand opening will be next week. We just converted that over into an event center. So we, we had the, the goal of, of not just having a spiritual center for the education of the adults, but we needed a place to educate our babies. We needed a place 
that we can come and get food that was in accord with a divine diet that our people were attracted to. And we wanted a place that you can come and get yourself together. Thus, really, the idea came out of the mind of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. He has said one time that an ideal mosque to me would be, and he named these ingredients, and we went to work uh, to make his word bond, and we were blessed to do so. Well, you wrote a few books. Uh, one of them is Financial Coonery, Black Dollars Matter. Well, that was a lecture. Oh, lecture. That, okay, that was a lecture so, I did. So th these are probably lectures as opposed yes, to Yes, those, if you're on the site, those are lectures. I do have four books. Um, okay. And one is Before You Say I Do. That's about mate selection. It's the most important decision you could ever make in your life after choosing to believe in God is to pick the right one to spend the rest of your life with. The mate, the mate you choose will either inspire you to grow into your greatness or confine you to complacency. They'll either be your other half or make you a half of yourself. The minister said, like, it's a good relationship will bring out the best in you and cause you to become more youthful, and a bad one will bring out the worst in you and age you prematurely. So mate selection is something we've been struggling with as this was one of those three sciences that they said in 1867 on the halls of Congress that must never be taught to the slaves. So what happened, Vlad, is that as we were moving to all of these cities, being invited to speak, no matter who was inviting us, we always found that we was off in a corner at the hotel in a sidebar counseling session talking to somebody that was coordinating these events about their relationship problems. And I said, man, you know, when marriage is done right, your home becomes a spiritual recharge center where you can break away from the wickedness of the world, let your firewall down and come home to a place of pure love where you can plug into and extract peace and power. But whenever the organizers that are fighting for freedom, justice, and equality have to go home and get drained. And I said, man, the, the last thing that a man wants to come home to after fighting in this world is to have to go round two with his own woman. And the last thing a woman wants to come home to after fighting in this world is to find a man that ain't been fighting at all. So I figured that if we can cut down on all these you know, secret little meetings over there by the copying machine in the hotel, and we done made the business off of our, our. I said, so I got before you say I do, and after you say I do. And now we go, and we still have marital problems, but I can do like those old school doctors and say, take two of these and call me in the morning. So that's how those two came about. My other two is Let Your Mind Be In You and Seven Jewels of God. Well, the, the lecture, Financial Coonery, what does that mean? Well, it is, a, it is an analysis of the kind of bad spending habits that we've adopted, uh, in particular as black people in America. We are, unfortunately, we participate because of the high stress level. We participate as a people in something that I call retail therapy. And, and we blame as a people, we blame the white man for 95% of our problems, but still not spend 97% of our money with them. We, 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 we are the leaders in unnecessary spending. You know, unnecessary spending is buying stuff you don't need with money that you don't have from people that you don't like to impress people that you don't even know. So it's a, it's a sad state uh, that we have brought in last year, they're estimating in 2018, that we brought in $1.3 trillion as black people in America. Out of 226 nations on earth, that makes us the eighth richest nation on the planet. We brought in $700 billion more than Mexico, $600 billion more than Spain. Yet Spain has 46 million people and a 208,000 square mile land mass, and they're able to provide for themselves as an independent nation. Mexico has 131,200,000 people in population and 771,500 uh, uh, acres of land that they're maintaining with, 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 with less than half the money we have. So what this says is for all of these nations to have half in income, half in money, but double in independence, we got a lot of dollars, but we need some more sense. So we were, in that message, we were trying to show our people 
how to disconnect. Right now, Vlad, unfortunately, our brain as a people has been hardwired from happiness to spending. But we got to rehardwire and take it from happiness to spending and take it from happiness to saving and happiness to investing. So financial coonery is a, a bad habit of the misuse of dollars based upon our suffering and our stress and inappropriate use of the resources we have. Yeah, one of my uh, side projects is a uh, is an Instagram page called Vlad Stocks, mm. where I talk about stock investing, and uh, because I felt the hip hop community just knows absolutely nothing about it. It's not it's not pushed, it's not co signed, and I wanted to be one of the first voices out there as a as a bigger voice to actually push investing and so forth, and which caused you know it's triggered thousands of people to start investing for the first time. Man, and I've always said that. You know, if you if you love Nike sneakers, before you buy your next pair of Nikes, why don't you buy a, a share of Nike stock? Right. Because that Nike stock will appreciate over time, and it also has a dividend. But those sneakers are going to be worthless after you wear them a few times. That's and right. And I think it really changed a lot of people's perception of it. Well, I I, I think that is a good step uh, in rehardwiring the brain. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Uh, he never really encouraged us to invest in the sense of the Dow Jones or the NASDAQ, or, or, but he encouraged us to invest in self. So what he wanted us to do is to take the money we have saved, find six or eight people that have the same idea that we have, and then let's pull our mind, money, and muscle, our time, talent, and treasure together and let's put that money and that muscle together and let's get us a business for ourselves that when we leave the planet, we can leave something to our babies. So I think that that uh, programming that you have put out to help rehardwire the brain uh, is a good step. And I would hope that we would go into the uh, Nipsey Hussle uh, persona and be one that comes back to the area that produced us. And instead of trying to put a lot of money into collaborative efforts, efforts with big corporations, start creating some small little corporations in your hood that we can actually make it a neighborhood again. I always say, Vlad, I wonder, why do we always call it the hood when the real thing is neighborhood? And, and you know what? The reason we call it the hood instead of the neighborhood is because the concept and function of neighbor is missing from the environment where we share space and time. So we've got to get back to that it takes a village to raise a child. We have to get back to the principle of shop with your brother before you shop with another. We have to get back to that principle where we start calling one another brothers and sisters. Because if I'm your brother and, some, and, and the sister is my sister, my son is her nephew and her daughter is my niece, every problem becomes a family problem. And I think that if we did that, we would graduate out of having sympathy for one another into having empathy for one another. Sympathy means that I don't like that something happened to you bad and I feel bad that you feel bad. But empathy means when whatever happens to you, I feel it like as if it, as if it happened to me. When we get to that level, I think that we'll uh, be able to see that thriving instead of surviving that we see in the inner city communities.